Thank you, church. This morning we're going to continue on with the message that I preached last week, and it is what happens after you die. This morning, again, take out your Bibles as we're going to look at a lot of texts. First text is our text that uh, Carl read this morning. Turn to John chapter 5. Let's look at verses 24 through 29. John chapter 5. Verses 24. Most surely I say to you that he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most surely I say to you that when, or the hour is coming and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So let's stop there and ask a couple of questions. The first question is, is... If you're a believer in Christ, when you die, do you go to heaven? What does this set of verses tell us? Jesus said that the hour is coming, and let's start from there. Verse 25, most surely I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will what? So... At death, are you still somehow alive? No. At death, Jesus said, the hour is coming, and now is, and I'm going to ask you why he said now is, that the dead will hear his voice and live. So after you die, how do you live again? You have to hear the voice of the Son of God. Is that not what that text says? Yes. Right? Why did he say the hour is coming and now is? Do you know what Jesus did after what he's talking about here? What event comes next? Does he go to the tomb of Lazarus? Raise him from the dead? And again, I asked you, why did he call Lazarus specifically by name? Because he only wanted Lazarus to come forth. Okay, so let's continue to look at this verse 25. I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will what? Hear his voice, and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now, when do these two resurrections take place? Oh, hold on. When do these resurrections take place? First of all, to call the dead back to life, Jesus has to do it. Is that right? Yes. So, when does Jesus call the righteous back to life? It's at the second coming, right? So, what I want you to think about is, if you died, and Jesus said that the Father gave him the authority to have judgment. Is that right? What is he going to judge? He's going to judge those who will come back to life for uh, everlasting life, and those who will come back for condemnation. Is that right? If you die and go straight to heaven and judgment happens there, why is this talking about happening at a future date? If you die and go to heaven and your judgment is taking place then, why does Jesus need to come back and the dead raise back to life to be judged again? Does that make sense? That doesn't make sense to me. It never did. This is why... When I started studying with the Evans pastor, I had a lot of questions on this answer. And what he did is he took me back to the scriptures. Amen. I had come back, or I had come from a uh, Catholic background. And from um, the time that I was in kindergarten, first and second grade, I went to Catholic school. 
So, uh, and then we continued to go to Catholic Church for years after that. So I knew their doctrine, and they believed that when you die, you go either to heaven, to hell, or to purgatory. And when I started reading the Bible, and I started reading what Jesus said, there was a contradiction there. And I couldn't explain it. So when that poor Adventist pastor started to come to my house, I told you this before, but the man would come and expect, you know, an hour of Bible study. Three hours every time he came, he would have to call his wife and say, Honey, I'm not going to be home for dinner. And I give him credit because he did it every time he came. And so I kept asking these questions, and he would take me back to the Bible because I did not want to take his word for it. I wanted to know myself what the Word of God said. Poor man, what he didn't know is that I was studying with Jehovah's Witnesses at the same time. And also some other Protestant denominations. And I would go to them. And because the Adventists out of all of them knew his Bible the best. And I could remember what he said. And I would repeat it back to the people I was studying with and find out what their answer was. And whatever answer they gave, I remembered. And when the Adventist guy came back, I just hit him with that. We got to the point with the Jehovah Witnesses where we never got off of the validity of the moral law, that it was still binding. Uh, never got past that. They finally told me, look, we need to go on to a different subject. And I told them, if you can't show me this, there's no reason to go to a different subject. Because I know from being a Catholic that it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to lie, uh, and it's wrong to disobey your mother and your father. Right? So... Going back to the Adventist, I would ask him all these questions, all these questions. And it got to the point where the other guys just didn't want to study with me anymore. Um, but he, the, the, man, the man just kept coming back. I mean, I give him credit for that. And then he introduced me to another older man, Albert Zahowski. And, and that man knew his Bible really, really well. And there was not one question that I ever asked him that he was not able to show me from scripture. And I mean, I asked him not a bunch of questions from scripture, what the answer was. Uh, and that's when I started to realize that the messages that the Adventists taught were Bible-based. And that when we got done studying, they showed me a clear picture of Jesus Christ. Amen. What righteousness by faith really is and what end time events were going to be and I could see it clearly myself and I could understand it and that meant a lot to me so when you're looking at these texts and you hear some people say well when you die you go straight to heaven or you go to hell but you hear Jesus say that he has the power of life and he will call the dead from the grave and when you see the story about him raising Lazarus, he doesn't say to Lazarus to come down or come up. He says to come forth. But not only that, don't you think somebody would have interviewed Lazarus and said, dude, where were you at the last four days? What was it like? Did you see a light? Did you go to the light? Did you see your relatives? The Bible is silent. Lazarus does not say a word about what happened in those four days. But what you do find is that the scribes and Pharisees wanted to kill him again because that miracle they could not dispute. There was no way to get around that Jesus had the power to raise the dead and they couldn't say he raises the dead by Beelzebub like he cast, like they said he cast out demons from. So let's look at Daniel chapter 12 Verse 2. It's in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 12. That's the last chapter of Daniel. Actually, let's read uh, verses 1 and 2. It says, at that time, Michael shall stand up. Can you turn me down a little bit? The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. 
And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, what book? What event are they talking about when the people shall be delivered? Say it loud because you're right. Don't be afraid. The second coming. Is that right? Okay, so at the second coming, God's people will be delivered, who are written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, what does that mean, to sleep in the dust of the earth? What's the state of those people? They're dead, right? They died the first death. And that's the death that we die of natural causes or accidents, things like that. Jesus calls that a sleep. Why does he call it a sleep? Because it's temporary. Now, the second death, that is eternal. That's the death that those who will await to damnation and condemnation will face. That's the one you don't want to be in. Okay? Now, don't you hate lines? You ever go to Disney World? You ever deal with those lines there? Hate lines. Well, when the judgment comes, there's going to be lines there. You want to make sure you're in the right line, okay? Because Jesus is going to separate the sheep from the goats. You don't want to wake up and realize, I have all the goats. It's the wrong place because by that time it's too late, okay? This is why you have this life and you make your choice today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you wait too long, you may be surprised on that resurrection day. Listen, the ones who are going to have it the worst on that day are the ones who went into the grave thinking they were saved and come out of the grave realizing they're lost. Didn't Jesus say that on that day, many who call me Lord, Lord? He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I tell you? This, brothers and sisters, is life and death. Don't get so caught up in this world that you lose sight of there's a world to come. And what you do here is going to determine what happens there. So, Michael, or... Uh, Sorry, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake. Some to everlasting life, some to what? Shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. It says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. And many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Now I want you to skip down to verse 13. What happens? What was Daniel's destiny after this time? Say that. He was going to wait. Daniel was going to die. He was going to become an old man and he was going to pass away. And the Bible says that he was going to rest. But he was to look forward to a certain day. The day that his people would be delivered. Look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 13. But you, who's you? It's Daniel he's talking about. But you, Daniel, go your way till the what? The end. The end. The end of what? The end of Daniel's life or the end of earth's history? Okay? Think about this. When was Daniel going to see his Savior and when was Daniel going to be raised to life again? When Jesus comes a second time, right? But you, go your way till the end, for you shall, what? Rest. Rest. And will arise to your inheritance, when? At the end of days. When Christ comes, the last day of earth's history. Okay, does that make sense to you guys? Amen. Okay, that was Old Testament. Okay, that was Old Testament. So... Let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 29. This is New Testament. And let's see if the theology has changed from one to the other. 
And no, Acts chapter 2, verse 29. Carl, do you have that? Yes. Can you read that for me? Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Keep reading. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Where does it say when he wrote that? And uh, who wrote the book of Acts? Do you know? Luke. Luke. Uh, was Luke an apostle? Luke followed Paul. Right? So he was with Paul. So Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. Paul laid out New Testament theology, right? And he got it from who? Jesus. So if there was a change in the theology of the state of the dead, you would know it from here. So he writes that this is Peter speaking. Peter says, men and brethren, let me speak to you plainly, that the patriarch David is dead and his grave is with us today. It goes on to say that David has not ascended into the heavens. Can you read that, Ricky? Uh, this is Acts chapter 2, verse what? 34. Want to read that? For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself, but he says himself, the Lord said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, till I make your name. So, at death, did David go to heaven? No. Did that verse make it clear that David hasn't ascended into the heaven? Where's David at now? He's still in his grave, right? Waiting for Jesus to come back. Okay, so, that was Acts. Here's another question. How much do the dead know about what goes on in this earth after they die? Turn to Ecclesiastes. That's in the Old Testament, chapter 9. Do you know who wrote Ecclesiastes? Solomon. Solomon. What's, what's his nickname? Was he the dumbest man who ever lived? The wisest man, right? So, Solomon had great wisdom. So let's look at Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verses 5, 6, and 10. Patty, do you have that? Patty, tell me. The living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no reward, the memory of them is forgotten. Also they conduct their hatred and their envy and not perish. Nevermore will they have a share to anything yet under the sun. Whatever your man finds to do, do it with your mind, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom to pray to the Lord only. Okay, so, now, it said the dead know how much? Nothing. Did it actually use that word? Or am I saying that word? The dead know nothing. It also says, whatever your hands find to do now, do it with all your might. Because what do you have to look forward to? The grave. Okay? Now listen, I heard a pastor um, on the radio explain it this way. He said, well, you know, Solomon, when he wrote that at this time, he was steeped in uh, paganism because he had all those wives, and God was disciplining him, and he was depressed, and that's why he wrote that, because he had no hope. Is it in the Word of God? Is it inspired? Can we take it as truth? So again, like I told you from the beginning, that when you look at an issue like the state of the dead, you can't just take two or three, four or five verses. You have to take what the Bible says as a whole on it. Is that right? Here a little, there a little. And when you get the big context of what it's saying, you can come to a conclusion, and that's how we come to belief and doctrine. Is that right? <coughs> So, as I told you, there are a lot of texts concerning the state of the dead. There are only a handful that are confusing. 
So, some people have called this proof texting, and I have, I have been, I, <laughs> I have been told that that I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't, I shouldn't write sermons by proof texting. And I've always had a problem with that. And it's like, what's wrong with actually going through the Bible and seeing what it says on a subject about the whole thing? And taking those texts to be able to get a clear idea of what it says on that. If you want to call that proof texting, what I found out is the reason why they don't like proof texting is because it proves them wrong. <laughs> like I said, I've had people say, I shouldn't, I shouldn't write sermons like that. It's like, well, how can you use the Bible if you don't do that? If you don't bring out what the Bible says, I don't know. This is why I have all these texts. Because I don't want you to have an understanding about what I said. <laughs> because I have a Florida high school education. And back when I went to school, <laughs> you only had to show up. And you really didn't have to show up. And you passed. So don't take my word for it. Okay? Don't look at me like I know. Take what it says from Scripture. So we looked at Ecclesiastes. Turn to Psalms. Let's look at Psalms 115, verses 16 through 18. Psalm 115. Verses 16 through 18. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from, the time, from this time forth and forevermore. So when you look at this verse, what does it say about the dead praising the Lord? Why do the dead not praise the Lord? See, if you died and you went straight to heaven, don't you think you'd be able to praise the Lord? Amen. Don't you think you'd be able to look down and see what's going on? But we just read that the dead know nothing. It also says the dead do not praise the Lord. Now again, I heard a preacher say, these, these were the wicked dead. Okay? This is where I end this morning because time is getting late and I've got so many more texts to give you. But within the last three weeks, have I given you enough text from Scripture to where you can see clearly that God made man and God breathed into him the breath of life and man became a living soul? That from Scripture, it never says that man had an immortal soul. The Bible tells you in 1 Timothy is that only God has immortality. Paul tells us that we wait for that day when this mortal shall put on what? Amen. Immortality. Now, actually, can you give me five more minutes? Yeah. All right, listen, I got, I got ten minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Shouldn't say that because I'll, I'll take care of one. Turn with me, and here's a question I, that you need to look at and need to answer. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Who wrote 2 Corinthians? Here you go. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Bless you. Verses 6 through 10. Verse 6 says, So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. What did he mean that when we are at home in the body? He meant that as long as he's alive and he's in this body, this tent, that he's absent from the Lord. Okay? That was verse 5. Hold on. I lost it. That was verse 6. Um, at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that was verse 6. Let's look at verse 7. Oh, that's 
why the page turned because of the fan. <laughs> Verse 6 again. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, that we are absent from the Lord. For this is important because this is what's going to explain that text that's hard to understand. For we walk by what? Faith. By faith. And not by sight. So we are confident, yes, well pleased, whether to be absent from the body and to be what? Present with the Lord. Did he ever say that when I'm absent from the body, I will be present with the Lord? You got to read this in its context. What's he saying? He says that I know that as long as I'm alive, that I'll be absent from the Lord. He also says further on that it is better for you to be for me to be here because to live is Christ but to die is gain. What did he mean by that? Did he mean that at death he was going to go straight into the Lord's presence and be in paradise? Let's go back and let's look at this. Verse 7, what does it say? We walk by what? Faith. Why did he put in there, we walk by faith and not by sight, in the context of what he's talking about? If you die and you went straight into the Lord's presence, how much faith would that take while you're living on this earth? But as you, and let's take Paul's example, did this man know persecution? Did he know tribulation? Yes. Did he know what it meant to have all this pressure on him for all these churches? He was hated by his fellow man, uh, countrymen. Every time he went into a town, they would come behind him and try to undo everything he did. And he did this for many, many years. And he gets to the point where he's old, and he realizes at some point, he is going to die. And he makes this statement that he knows that when he dies, all that trial, all that persecution, and all that tribulation will be over with. And he knows that on that day, there will be a crown waiting for him. Why? Because he fought the good fight. Right? And do you know where that's about that? Second Timothy. Right? What was the last... Uh, epistle that Paul ever wrote. Second Timothy. Second Timothy, right? So he's coming to the end. He says to Timothy, for I know that I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. Okay? And then he says that he's run the race. He's finished the course. He knows that on that day a crown will be waiting for him. The question is, is what day? You have to go back to Daniel. And what did God say to Daniel? God said, go your way, and you will rest. And on that day, what day? The day that Michael will stand and his people will be delivered. What day is that? The second coming. So did Paul have his theology wrong? Or do we misinterpret what Paul says? Not we, because we're all Adventists, so. <laughs> Your finger's still there in 2 Corinthians? Okay. For we are confident, yes, this is uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Was Paul talking about death here? Look at the context. Is he talking about death when he makes that statement? If you were Paul and you went and dealt with everything that he had to deal with, if you were the people that he was writing these letters to and persecution was not just coming, but it was a fact of life and that you may be called to give your life for your allegiance to Christ, wouldn't it be better to be absent from the body, present with the Lord? At death, and you sleep in death, are you, are you able to tell how much time has lapsed from the moment you close your eyes in death to the time Christ wakes you up? 
you understand why Paul was able to say this? That he was able to say, it's better to be uh, absent from the body and present with the Lord? Again, you've got to ask yourself, was this man's theology wrong? How could he state that on that day, if you read the context of that day, it's the day Christ will come. How could he say this in one book and that in another book? 